take a break from the hustle. This is Halftime with Rob Thompson and Carl Schoening on San Antonio Sports Star, ESPN 1250 and 94.5 FM. Welcome back to Halftime. I'm Carl Schoening along with Rob Thompson. We go to the Kiobasa Bacon phone lines to be joined by the League of Justices, Amy Dash. She's going to join us to talk about a various topic of legal things, but the big story about Tyler Skaggs, the Angels pitcher who was found dead in a Dallas hotel. Amy, thank you so much for taking the time and joining the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Amy, real quickly, as you join us, and certainly your legal expertise, we're going to ask you some other questions regarding Deshaun Watson. But as we look at the Tyler Skaggs issue, and on my first blush, when I see this, I'm trying to find the uh, how how responsible are we going to find that the Angels are going to be for this? Are they going to be able to separate themselves from their employees, and can they from the situation that we found Skaggs in? Yeah, I think that's the most fascinating element of this, and it's really not something that anybody was discussing. I mean, this um, former employee was charged a while ago, and his case has sort of been churning through the legal process. And when the filing came out uh, last Friday that start, started to highlight, you know, all of the use of the facilities to do the alleged drug deals, um, there was a search warrant executed on Angel Stadium where they actually found uh, pills with traces of fentanyl in the employee's office. And then all this other evidence that the government has compiled against this employee where he's according to them, using his work email to talk with the suppliers, offering uh, memorabilia and tickets to the suppliers if they'll bring the drugs to the stadium because he can't leave work. He's in the middle of his work day. So that's the first thing that stood out to me that I felt really wasn't being covered at all is, wait a minute, you know, this is an employee of the organization. He had been an employee for over 20 years. There was evidence that he himself had drug problems. He had been in rehab. He had been hospitalized. People knew that he was an alleged addict. I mean, he says it. He's the, he, he told, you know, a bunch of investigators that there were multiple people within the organization that knew about his problems. And then the, the, um, his own family says that they also alerted at least one other person in the organization that he was giving drugs to the players. So that's my big question is, uh, should the angels be held liable or not? Did they actually know, which obviously they adamantly deny that they didn't, but there are indications from evidence from the government that they may have. So I think as we see the Skaggs civil lawsuit go through the legal process, which is, which is directly against the angels, um, the government's case against this ex-employee is going to be so helpful in the Skaggs family trying to hold the actual organization liable for this, you know, alleged drug ring that's going on inside its organization where multiple players are getting drugs from an employee. Amy Dash joins us on Halftime. She's the official legal analyst for CBS Sports Radio and Fox Sports Radio. Also, you can follow all of her content on League of Justice on Twitter at L-O-J sports. Uh, what is the potential fallout here? I, I know you have your fingers on the pulse of this as well as anybody, uh, and there's a lot more that'll probably come out. But, but from your view, what could the potential fallout be here for the Angels organization? Well, what I'm interested in finding out is whether the government is going to come and bring any type of a criminal suit against the organization. That would be fascinating to me because as they go through this process and they get discovery and we know that they subpoenaed the angels mm-hmm. and wanted their internal investigative report and they refused to hand it over, at least or at least uh, substantial portions of it that the government had tried to get its hands on. The question is, what are they hiding? Why won't they hand over the report? And what kind of evidence will surface in this uh, in this suit against the this criminal suit against the employee? And we know he's cooperating. So Mm -hmm. are the feds actually trying to compile evidence to hold the organization criminally liable? That's what I'm I'm curious about. Or will there just be the civil suit from the Skag family that tries to hold them liable? And, and will either of them succeed against the organization? Um, because there, there is a legal principle that basically says if you are an employer, you are responsible mm-hmm. for the wrongful acts of your employee. But those acts have to be committed in the scope of that employee's employment. And um, also, you know, during work hours, 
helps to prove that. Mm-hmm. So what the Skaggs family is saying is that they believe that, um, and, and the government, by the way, the government said Angel Stadium and the use of the facilities was part of this guy's, this employee's uh, criminal enterprise, modus operandi, you know, his pattern of criminal conduct. And then the Skaggs family is saying they believe that this drug use by the by lots of the players within the organization and the distribution of drugs was incidental to this uh, communication director's employment, meaning they're trying to make the argument that, you know, being in pain was sort of par for the course and that the organization expected, or at least the culture within the organization expected these players to sort of play through the pain. And so getting their hands on drugs and using the drugs help to further the mission of the organization. Now, whether that's true or not, that's what they're alleging, essentially. That's their theory of the case. So it's interesting to see if there's any merit to that. Amy Dash joining us here on San Antonio Sports Star. Fantastic article right now at League of Justice. Fentanyl that killed Tyler Skaggs delivered to Angel Stadium on day he died. Government claims our Angel's responsible for pitcher's death. I can tell you, Amy, uh, coming from uh, the state of Texas, there's a lot of attorneys, some many of which I know, look at the Angels and say, by the time I'm done with this civil suit, I'm going to own the Angels. It, it feels like, yeah, as yeah. you just defined, the, a criminal activity that was fostered in the office, that was done during work hours, and was uh, you know covered by the office. This is, uh, well, you know, guys are in pain. We're trying to get them out of pain. It's just part of our de- everyday business to distribute heroin or fentanyl mm-hmm. to make sure they're not in pain. It just feels like the civil suit might be far worse than the criminal suit at the end of the day. Yeah, well, well, listen, I mean, the employee was trying to get his hands on oxycodone, and he repeatedly asked, is there fentanyl? He was trying to avoid fentanyl. But, of course, you can't take the word of a drug dealer that the, that yes. the drugs are clean. So, obviously, you know, he knew there was a chance there could be fentanyl because he was repeatedly asking whether it was in the drugs um, and then just taking everybody's word for it. But I think the the title of the article at leagueofjustice.com, and thank you guys so much for highlighting my site, um, is is really, really critical here because – What the government is saying is that the actual counterfeit pills that were laced with fentanyl that killed Tyler Skaggs, that were the proximate direct cause of his death, those actual pills they believe they can prove were delivered to Angel Stadium Mm. on the day he died. They said their evidence will show that. So when you can directly link, you know, a drug deal that went down at Angel Stadium with an employee before he goes on a road trip and then he distributes it to the player on the road trip during work hours. Uh, that's a problem for the Angels organization. So if they can prove that, uh, it would be interesting to see how the Angels organization can defend that. And even if the Angels organization did not know, uh, still might have an obligation, just technically, legally speaking, to be supervising its employees, training its employees, vetting its employees to make sure that there's not a drug addict and drug dealer within the organization who's employed for more than 20 years. A remarkable story that I cannot imagine how far this will go. I wonder how far that the Angels will go to just settle this thing so it can go away if the criminal suit looks as bad as it appears. We're joined by Amy Dash, a a legal analyst for all your favorite outlets. And in this day and age, you're staying busy, Amy. Let's can we take a minute and look to our east over to Houston as we're coming to you from San Antonio in the Deshaun Watson situation as he sits right now. We've heard some whispers from the FBI that they're investigating. Now, his attorney says, well, they might be investigating the fact that he might have been blackmailed. There, He's saying that. But it does feel to me like uh, the charges are pointed toward human trafficking. Uh, Do you get the feeling that's where they are headed? It's really a big question, Mark. But we know that at the uh, local level, At least it's been reported by some reporters in the area that there's a grand jury investigation and subpoenas are being handed out by the chief of the human trafficking division. Whether there's a there there, we still don't know. Um, And and we don't even know if that's true, that report that the grand jury is investigating. But certainly the FBI, FBI is investigating now what they're investigating, whether it's the allegations surrounding him or this alleged extortion attempt on him is still unclear because the FBI won't confirm or deny that there's even an investigation. But we know that his attorney did confirm that Watson and he were contacted by the FBI many months ago and that Watson did actually speak with the FBI. And then the attorney for the plaintiffs is saying that the FBI met with him several times and interviewed multiple clients of his and that he's met with the assistant United States uh, attorney. 
So uh, it certainly sounds serious. Now, which direction it's heading, really, it would be speculative to make a guess. But I think that um, there are certainly uh, there are certainly clues within the plaintiff's complaints that they're alleging some sort of uh, you know some sort of sexual assault that could be linked to human trafficking. Um, I was told that the complaints were drafted in a specific way, and a lot of the language there would help to prove a human trafficking claim if, in fact, uh, there's evidence that supports it. So I think just finding that evidence, which obviously Watson and his attorney deny that, that that's even a plausible claim. So so the FBI and the local police having to find that evidence to prove all those elements, and there are many, many elements, it's not easy mm-hmm. to prove human trafficking. Uh, that's really what we're going to have to wait and see about. Real quickly, uh, the, the, the definition of human trafficking, it, from what I've been led, we've been led to believe, it involved him paying for a flight paying for the money, giving the, the, the alleged uh, victim uh, money to fly from over state lines. I guess it was from New Orleans to Houston and then paying for the Uber. To, does that, under your understanding of the definition of human trafficking, does that fall into that? Well, well, it's extremely complicated, so uh-huh. I don't want to. I don't want people to oversimplify it. So they would have to prove many things. They mm-hmm. would have to prove that either someone was transported. It doesn't have to be transported. It could be recruited or solicited. But at the time that that person was solicited, recruited, transported, and there, are, you know, many other ways uh, to prove that 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 the person who was doing it. So let's say in this case, if it was Deshaun Watson doing it, that at the time he was trying to get that person over to him. He was doing it with the knowledge and intent that when the person arrived, they were gonna, he was going to force them to, uh, to, to be sexually exploited right. okay. and then pay them for that sexual exploitation. So you have to not only prove actions, but you have to prove a mindset and an intent, which is very hard to prove. So I think, um, you know, you have the women saying, I thought that I was uh, coming for um, to give a massage and being paid for that. But then I was, you know. They're alleging forced to commit sexual acts and, and then given money. So was it for the sexual acts or was it for the massage? Or what, what was the intent of him getting me over here? Why, why was he really contacting me? And, and then, of course, Watson might say, I just wanted a massage. But then when the person came over, because he said that a couple of women he had uh, consensual sexual mm-hmm. acts with, you know, it evolved into something more. And they wanted to just as much as I did. So really, the authorities have to parse through who's telling the truth and whether there's evidence that could support something more than just uh, procuring somebody for a massage, but then it later escalating into consensual sex. And I think the pattern of so many women coming forward with similar allegations could potentially help them say, listen, why was he reaching out to so many people on Instagram? Why are so many women alleging the same thing? But, but they need more than that. They need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he intended to get people over to him sexually exploit them through force or coercion or intimidation or stress or a power imbalance and then pay them for that sexual exploitation. Does it feel to you that the civil suit might be um, the suits that are certainly at play here at some point? The preponderance issue, it seems to be a little bit easier there than it would be the BRD, the beyond reasonable doubt there on the criminal side. Because at the end of the day, don't we come down to a he said, she said? Well, yeah, but you know what? There is other evidence that I believe exists. And actually, there's evidence on Watson's side, too. You know, Watson's saying that some of the women that accused him of, let's say, for example, forcing oral sex, which is a a felony accusation, um, his attorney read some text messages from that woman allegedly the day after this forced massage, uh, this forced oral sex, where she's thanking him for the opportunity to give him a massage, asking Mm -hmm. if he wants another, apologizing for her behavior. If those texts are in fact true, it casts doubt on her allegations. So I think credibility is a big thing. And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that can prove or disprove credibility, not just direct messages between him and these women, but things that they may have said or texted to family members or friends, or even um, they're saying some security guards that worked at these salons witnessed some of their behavior after they emerged from the uh, massage room. So there's a lot uh, that can be compiled to try to show uh, whether a person's being honest or not with their allegation. She's Amy Dash. You can follow her on Twitter at Amy Dash TV. She has a lot of great in-depth articles that you can find on leagueofjustice.com and follow that account at lojsports.com. And Amy, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us here on Halftime. We do appreciate you.
Oh, that's my pleasure. I appreciate you both. Thank you so much. Amy Dash, I'll tell you what, in this day and age, if you're a legal analyst towards sports, you're going to be employed full time. And this is she knows her stuff. Man. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, she's a great fall. I've been following her for a long time. And when this, you know, Tyler Skagg stuff came out, I reached out to her. And yeah, she has a lot of great information. Boy, all big follower. I'll tell you, from what she is saying, the angels are in trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if if the cops can prove that this was done as part of everyday course of work for this four billion dollar team. That killed a man? Oh, oh, that's going to cost a little bit. That's going to cost a little bit. Maybe they'll get their own uh, side of the stadium. It'll be their side. They can keep the tickets. That's probably <laughs> what it will cost because that's a, that's a sad story coming out of uh, the Angels organization.